What's going on, Macromob family? I'm Sean. I'm joined by my co-host, Damien. And if you didn't know, now you know we're completely unqualified and uninterested with providing you with financial, social, legal, or life advice. So today we actually have a pretty good show for you all today. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Things are becoming more unstable around the world. And, and things, certain countries are already less stable than, let's say, your, your more superpowers, you know, the United States, Canada, things like that. So we wanted to share some of the global protests, some of the unrest that's going on in Peru, Sri Lanka, Greece, Turkey, and also let you all know why you all should be paying attention to it and why it could be coming to your neck of the woods next and why it's important. Yeah, um, there are so many protests around the world. It was hard to just pick a few. So I kind of thought about which ones have not been obvious in the news and which ones um, are probably quietly something we should be paying attention to. So the first is uh, Peru. Um, Peru is going through an issue now. It's got the highest inflation in 20 years. Same thing as many other countries. Food's getting more expensive. Fuel's getting more expensive. They're out of fertilizer. Uh, the entire country is seeing protests pop up from the capital to remote areas uh, more known for their tourism. Um, the interesting thing about these protests is that they are not limited to a political group. They are being led by truckers, farmers, unions, the, the people who are directly impacted by price changes. Um, what do they want? They want lower water prices, lower utility prices. Uh, and another thing they're asking is for the Constitution to be re rewritten. Um, in 1993, the former president of Peru, his name is Alberto Fujimori, he's actually now in prison. Um, people might have seen in the last few weeks, there was a, um, his pardon was overturned because they really want to keep him in prison uh, to avoid political unrest. <clears throat> but he, he, he created a constitution that was incredibly business friendly, particularly to the mining operations in Peru. Um, imagine getting rid of almost all the regulations, all the taxes. Um, and what it did is he sold it to the people as something that would really help investment and take Peru to the next level. But it turned out to be a corruption grab and is also one of the reasons that he's in prison. Um, you know, the current president's also a disaster, okay? His name is President P Pedro Castillo. He's only been in office for about a year. And what's interesting about him is you would think he would be perfectly positioned to address these issues because he's quite to the left. Um, but he's just had a bad go of it, to put it mildly. He's had lots of scandals, bad appointments. He's gone through four prime ministers. He's had two impeachment votes, which he's barely survived. Um, he may, some people may have seen him in the news. Peru had probably the worst pandemic response of any country in the world. They had the highest death rate as a proportion of the population. Um, and I put the number there from the BBC.com. He's currently got a 19% approval rating. That's down from 24%. So he's just falling like a rock. Mm, and it's so, so bad that even Congress, like his Congress has asked him to resign, uh, but he said no. Uh, a few weeks ago, he put on a curfew to try and stop the protest and it just backfired terribly. Five people were killed. Um, some additional people were injured. Um, and now he's trying to, his government is trying to investigate what happened. Well, you know, the answer is that he sent police out there to stop the protest and it backfired. He's trying to hold on for dear life. So he recently waived fuel taxes and some taxes on food, but it really looks like he's about to be gone. You know, the, the thing that's interesting about Peru is it is the second biggest producer of copper in the world. Most of that is mined out of the Andes, which is, you know, a beautiful area of the world. And these protests have shut down so far, about 20% of the mining, and it's getting bigger. The protesters have shut off water to the uh, mines, which they, you know, they need to extract the copper. 
And what they're demanding is that they get a share of these profits, these, um, you know, if, if you, um, if you think that they're extorting, uh, extracting not only the minerals, but also taking all the profits out of the country, you, you wouldn't be wrong. Um, they have started off with a demand of $5 billion. Uh, they want it shared with local communities. Uh, there are two big mines some people may have heard of. One is called Las Bombas and one is called Cuajon. Um, they've been closed for six weeks. So the um, copper is just not being exported. The president thinks, I, I think he's thinking about doing a state of emergency to force those mines open. And, you know, probably that's not going to work, work too well for him either. But the, the interesting thing about Peru, again, is, is the copper. And so, you know, what is it to you? Where do you use copper? Well, um, copper, if you uh, search online, search the term Dr. Copper, kind of like the soft drink, but with the word copper. That phrase um, is used by a lot of economists because they sort of see the change in copper prices around the world as a change of overall economic health. And there is a lot of data that shows when copper prices drop and copper prices are fairly stable, that it's quite a cheap item and they do, it doesn't drop much. But when they drop, historically, the global economy gets screwed. Um, Obviously, copper is used in electrical wiring, construction. Um, almost everything you can think of in your computer has copper in it. Microchips, the semiconductors, the uh, things you're waiting for to put in your cars that aren't being taken off the production line have copper in them. Um, roofs, hinges, um, hydraulic lines, boat propellers. Um, I thought this was interesting. Electric cars on average contain about 55 pounds of copper each. So you think you're going to get an electric car to save money on gas? You might not be able to get one. Yeah, that's uh, why that that green revolution is so interesting, because you're going to have to exploit the earth even more, especially <laughs> in these countries that are already on the brink of instability and, and they already have been exploited by more powerful countries and we're going to come over there and take the resources. Yeah, that's the green part. You have to cut down trees to start your car. Um, uh, saxophones, uh, you know, I, I guess I thought saxophones are made out of brass or something, but they're made mm -hmm. out of copper. And then, you know, if, if something happens to our Statue of Liberty, if we need a spare, we won't be able to make it because it's copper. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, you know, a personal thing. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's, I would encourage people to keep an eye on Peru. It seems like a, you know, just like Ukraine, it seems like a small country that's not, you know, in our um, sort of in our view all the time. But it, it's the type of thing where when you begin to notice things missing at the store, it might be Peru's fault. Uh, the, the second country I looked at is Sri Lanka. Um, some people say Sri Lanka, but I think it's pronounced Sri Lanka. Um, they are going through the worst economic crisis basically in their history since 1948. They've got 22 million people there. They've been having 13 hour a day power outages. Food prices are up 30% from last year. Fuel shortages, of course. Um, economists who've been looking at Sri Lanka um, have been, and I quoted this article, they're saying that they're going through something called twin deficits. Okay, basically they got a budget shortfall. They don't have enough money to pay their bills and they've got a current account deficit. In other words, they're spending more money than they have, and they don't produce enough to trade to dig out of it. So they're in a really bad position. The thing that's interesting about Sri Lanka is they are almost out of currency, foreign currency altogether. And that was a kind of bad decision by the government. They basically, be spent all their currency a few years ago and now they can't pay off their debt they can't buy imports they're running out of fertilizer and medical supplies so at the beginning of april the government tried to declare the state state of emergency just like in peru uh, they've been pretty tough they're cracking down on speech and the right to assembly and they passed this uh they made this legal change saying that you can you can exercise your rights as long as you don't impede national security, public security, racial and religious harmony, super vague. 
and uh, people are kind of scared about what may happen if they do protest. Uh, just this week, there were police who off fired into a crowd and uh, one person was killed. Again, the government there is investigating it uh, and probably nothing will come of that. The, the president of Sri Lanka, his name is Gotabaya Rajapaksa. And one of the things that protesters want is they want him out as well. Not only do they want him out, they want his whole family out. Um, his brother has been prime minister four times. They kind of switched off and on. And there are four of their relatives in the cabinet. Of course, they're in the best positions, finance, defense. I think one is in the, the minister of sports. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, minister. Of, I can do that job right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I promise you. Well, especially if you're all brothers. I mean, that's the job I would have taken. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll for sure. sports. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Maybe you know what? Actually, I would have probably I would have liked a dual position. I kind of want to be over sports in general, and then maybe I don't know, like the arts or something. I'd probably yeah. show up at a few opera theaters, sports, and and beaches or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Well, the the government is doing what governments do. They're blaming the pandemic and they're blaming lack of tourist dollars for their problems. Um, People who know anything about Sri Lanka is it's had um, a rough history. Uh, there is a there are is an ethnic group there called the Tamils, um, and historically there's been some some violence related to that. The government blamed some bombings in the past few years on them, um, but that was three years ago. Really, what the cause of their problems are is that in 2019. They did a huge tax cut right before the pandemic. Okay. So no money was coming in and no money's been coming in. Then, um, probably due to uh, corruption or favoring of local businesses, the president put a ban on imported fertilizer. Well, they didn't have enough fertilizer to grow their own crops. So it led to widespread crop failure. So they've got an internal food crisis in addition to an inability to buy food from overseas. He put that banned on fertilizer. The president. Yeah, but he, what was his logic? His Why? logic was to try and spur local businesses. And uh, the, gotcha. farmers, <clears throat> the farmers were opposed to it then because they said, we don't, we don't have enough fertilizer production in the country. But it, was, it looked like a gift to one of the companies there that makes fertilizer, right? Um, so of course the price of fertilizer went up and there wasn't enough. Gotcha. So they're, they're hugely in debt. They owe four, they've got to make $4 billion in debt payments this year. Okay. 12.5 billion of that is in international sovereign bonds. Okay. So they, they have, they have taken out every uh, kind of credit to to finance themselves, bonds, um, other types of debt. Now they're turning to China, India, and back to the International Monetary Fund for more money. I think recently they asked them each for $1 billion. Here again, they're thinking of amending the Constitution to kind of stay in power. And um, recently the president said, we, we're going to try and do it to make it more accountable to the people. In other words, uh, maybe removing some of the obvious business-friendly um, clauses, but they, they just hide them somewhere else. But Sri Lanka is in a real bad spot. They have, they have no way out of this that I, I can see without really getting hurt. Why does it, why does it matter to us? Um, well, Sri Lanka exports about $15 billion worth of goods. Um, most of our textiles, our clothes, our tea, um, that's really where the United States gets all of that from. Um, I talked a bit about the history of instability. It's very complicated and I don't want to um, get anything wrong about it, but there is definitely a fear that this kind of food insecurity and political instability may rile up things again with uh, cultural relations. Um, Sri Lanka is a, a partner in almost all these major free trade agreements. So. When you think about a free trade agreement with China, India, Pakistan, and the Asia Pacific, Sri Lanka is in there. And, and the main reason they're in there is because they are a, a shipping hub. They're an aviation hub. So 
that's really how they've created a niche for themselves by um, playing a role where they are the go-between in trade and making money off that. So um, I think later, Sean and I are going to talk more about shipping, but I just thought it was, it's interesting how these things just pop up. So here you have a, a small nation um, that ha plays a big role in the supply chain around the world and it's hurting itself. Um, so it can have goods go through it, but it can't pay for any of the goods to come off the, the ship for its own people. It's, it's really um, a sad sort of story. The, the last one, and I didn't spend a lot of time on this one, is Greece. Um, Greece has been a, I, I, I don't say this to be an insult, but I think it's pretty clear that Greece for the past couple of decades has been a burden to the European Union. It has had economic problem after economic problem. It has been broke. It has had to been, it has been bailed out by Germany and France over and over. May, most of its problems came because Greece traditionally had a very um, costly welfare state, early retirements, lots of benefits, and that's how politicians survived. But when it came to pay for it all, there wasn't any money. So they have been trying to right their ship for some time now. But, you know, when you're, when you're trying to fix things and then the world, the, you know, the world doesn't wait for you to get, get your house in order. Um, protest Greece, same thing. Farmers protesting. They want tax cuts. They, they want subsidies. So they want more money to keep them afloat. And there isn't any. Um, there are some huge um energy costs basically there's been these 24-hour strikes from different sets of workers that have gone on and off um the industry the trade minister basically has told uh he's, it's kind of a state of emergency he's told all the fertilizer producers that they cannot export any more fertilizer and so uh you know essentially the danger with that is that because Greece doesn't have, the government doesn't have a lot of money, these exporters are gonna be a little unhappy because they're gonna have to accept less for their product at a time when fertilizer prices are through the roof. So right now, I think the government spent about $4 billion since September to try and, try and ease the pain on households. Um, but because Greece has been a, Greece has been a sort of sick uh, limb in Europe for quite some time. And being right in the center there, that means these other European countries are going to have to do something to keep Greece, Greece's issues from affecting them. Yeah, they're going to have to they're going to have to find a way to help try to stabilize them because at the, the worst thing that can happen is a refugee crisis because any country that has to take those people in has to feed them, they have to clothe them. They have to provide a medical care and other countries are already so strained right now. They don't want to be put into a position. So they need to work together to stop these other countries from blowing up. Well, and the tough thing is for years, um, you know, and, and, and Greece, Greece does get punished a, a, a little more than maybe they should. But for years, uh, the sort of bigger European powers have been warning Greece that, you know, we can't keep bailing you out. You have to, you have to fix these issues. You have to find a way you have to, um, you know, change your social, uh, benefit system. And it, it does look like Greece has made some progress in that, but there is no political will I'm sure in Germany and in France or in, in great Britain to bail out Greece if something goes down. Um, those were the three that were the most interesting to me. Uh, and you know, there are so many more and I'll probably do another short one of these, but I wanted to say something that I came across, um, uh, just generally about global instability. So the United Nations world food program puts out these reports and the head of that program just released data showing that from 2019 to 2022, the number of people on the brink of famine went up from 27 to 44 million people. And if you think that's shocking, 
the the next category down, which is basically one step away from famine, okay, is 232 million people. That is a massive amount of people who are, you know, this is beyond food insecurity. Um, the So what has been happening is we're seeing, we've talked about Egypt a few times. They've got some, they've put some controls on grain exports. Everyone's trying to hold on to what they have. Turkey, uh, the they had a big run on the last sunflower oil that they've got. Uh, people are storing it. They're trying to figure out how to keep consumers from, you know, just like here in the U.S., we had a run on toilet paper that wasn't probably legitimate, but stores would say, okay, you could only buy two or three um, packs. So they're trying to do that with sunflower oil. Um, the UN Food World Program has declared severe hunger emergencies in Morocco, Sudan, Yemen, Syria, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. Um, that means quietly, you know, while our news is, is covering one part, of, one part of the world, quietly instability is just getting out of control. And these are countries that have, with the exception of Morocco, okay, um, these are uh, countries that have been in conflict in recent history, all right? Um, and some of them for most of their history. Um, I'm going to do a video, a short video soon about India, because there's one country that may be, I don't want to say benefiting from uh, what's going on, but positioning itself really well to come out of the instability or this global recession in a better position, and that's India. Um, they have exported another 6 million tons of wheat. They have record rice and corn exports right now. Um, they are looking at what's going on in Ukraine and making sure that they find a path to replacing Ukraine as a global wheat exporter. So, you know, that is something um, to keep an eye on for the future. But also, you know, in the in the next year, whether that'll be successful, because if it if it is, that could just rocket India's agriculture economy even bigger than it is. Yeah. And that also that also tells you that they don't believe that that area of the world is going to be stable anytime soon. So, you, no, go ahead. Well, uh, sorry. And the thing I forgot to mention is one of the ways they're doing it is by uh, ignoring the sanctions. They are importing um fertilizer from Russia. So at a discount. Yep. At a discount. So they're not doing it, uh, internally based on their own, uh, you know, uh, efforts. They are, uh, the president Modi of India recently said, you know, take this, uh, uh, for what it's worth that India is now self-sufficient in food. So now we need to move to being a global leading leader in exports. And while he was doing that, they were, bringing in imports from Russia of fertilizer that's been banned uh, according to the, you know, the, the rules that he's supposed to follow as a global leader. But, you know, um, there's probably going to be more of that. I'll, I'll see if I can find some more shenanigans like that around the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of shenanigans and we'll keep everybody updated on not only the unrest and the protest, but what is going to be the government's response. Is the government going to crack down violently on these groups, on the people? And if they do, can the people fight back? And then can they overthrow the governments? We'll see. I think think governments are going to respond differently around the world. I think believe you are going to see some despotic regimes. You are going to see some violence. You are going to see the police. You are going to see the military. And then who knows? Hopefully, hopefully things come out better on the other side, but we don't know. Things can always change and we'll update you. Dave, did you want to leave them with anything else? No, I just, um, again, I, I think um, we've talked about this a couple of times, but food insecurity that we face in the U.S. for, for, most, for most people is n nowhere as serious as what we see around the world, but it doesn't mean that it's not as important. So, Again, keep an eye around your own your own community. 
for um, for uh, food drives or uh, food um, uh, shelters that may need your help. Uh, again, it's it's tougher for people to donate any money, but if you've got some additional cans or if there's something you could do or even volunteer, it's very important to uh, keep an eye on your on your neighbors and make sure that they don't go hungry. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll catch you all in the next one. Take care.